Yes! What do you think? New desk setup. <laughs> Uh, main reason I moved stuff around was because previously this desk was up against the wall and the camera would have been sort of where that bonsai tree is in relation to the desk. So every time I wanted to turn around to look at the camera I'd sort of hit my drawers down here with my seat. Didn't really work. This is much better though. I'm sat right in front of this window which is great apart from when it's sunny. Hmm didn't really think that through but never mind it's not sunny at the moment so this video is my top 10 tips for beginners in photoshop the last video i did was all about how photoshop works for real complete beginners and if that or any other video has piqued your interest and you've started playing around in photoshop hopefully these 10 i think there are 10 10 ish tips uh, will help you <laughs> Okay, tip number one is name your layers. Sometimes when I'm working on concepts, I end up with well over 100 layers. And if I've got too excited about trying to do a concept as fast as possible to see what it'll turn out like, I don't always organize my layers that well. And it ends up being an absolute nightmare. I'll have to turn everyone on and off to work out what does what. Not good. So I'd suggest naming your layers. Tip number two, learn the transform tool inside out. When you've got a layer selected, control T is the shortcut. The transform and when you press shift you keep everything in proportion but i'm not just talking about scale i'm talking about skew distort perspective and warp really really powerful tools when you're compositing it means if you don't get it quite right when you're shooting in the field you can sometimes make adjustments in photoshop to change perspective and save an image make it much more believable really super important to learn how to use those tools tip number three use smart objects where possible so i've got my smart object here which is characterized by this little symbol in the corner of the layer let's just go to filters blur Gaussian blur, uh, and let's go nearly eight pixels, a bit crazy. You can see it's blurred it. But this filter can be turned on and off and it can be adjusted. Now if I hadn't made this layer a smart object and did the same thing, Gaussian blur, then I can't get out of it. The only way I can get out of it is to go back. So using smart objects avoids what we call destructive changes, i.e. you can get out of them really easily. You're not making permanent changes to a layer or an image. The other benefit of smart objects is that if you change the size of the layer you're working in and later decide you want to blow it up again, then the smart object will have saved all the information from before. If you don't use smart objects and you transform your image to be smaller, if you then want to blow it up again later, it won't look good because all the information from before will have been lost. So yeah, smart objects. Pretty easy to make a smart object. What you do is you right click on the layer, create a smart object. And Bob is your uncle. Right, what's next? I've got a list here. I can't remember 10 tips. Uh, clipping masks. Clipping masks. If I create a new layer on top of my balloon here, press Alt and click, it then becomes a clipping mask. So any changes that I make, say for example I want to paint, will only affect the layer that's beneath it. Now if I unclip this layer, it'll make changes universally. But if I reclip it, it only makes changes to the layer that it's clipped to. Hundreds of uses for that one, really good to have in your locker. Yes. If you've watched some of my other videos, you'll know that I've struggled trying to stabilize a camera in a car before. So hopefully this one will mean that I can drive and talk at the same time for all the outdoor adventures when uh, when spring eventually turns up. Although it's not going to be today. You can see. Shit. Uh, what tip are we on? Sharpening. Sharpening, sharpening. High pass. There are loads of ways to sharpen images. Most of them are terrible. The only way that I really trust to sharpen images is called a high pass filter. So, so let's say that I just want to sharpen this bottom layer. So I'll duplicate it. I'll go to filter other high pass and you'll see it produces this outline of the edges and the edges that you see show what will be sharpened so the more you increase this the more will be sharpened typically i find three to five works pretty well click ok change this layer to overlay and you've got a sharpened image let's zoom in to show you so this is with it on this is off on off so you've now got a sharpened image that only affects the edges that you want it to affect, not every single pixel. Typically with sharpening tools, they affect much more than you want to affect. Uh, so I find high pass is the best way to do it. Tip number six. Yes, six. Drop shadows. Shadows 
are one of the most important elements of making a composite look realistic. Uh, and typically, how I start with shadows is I make a drop shadow. So on the balloon layer, I'm gonna go down here and select drop shadow. Now there are all kinds of different options here and, and you can have your own fun experimenting with them. Uh, you can take the distance away, you can, make, you can make it larger, you can make it softer. The most important point here that I want to show you is that if you right click on the effect and go create layer, then you can put the shadow on its own layer and that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of moving it around and transforming it to fit your own needs. A lot of the time I won't actually use the shadow that this drop shadow layer creates uh, because it's not particularly realistic. Shadows drop off with light, they also get softer. This doesn't necessarily do that. What it does do is a lot of the time gives me an accurate representation of what the shadow should look like in terms of shape and then I can do my own changes in other layers. <sighs> next, 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 next. Tip number seven. I've said this before in another video, get a tablet. They're super cheap and will save you so much time not having to mask with your mouse or trackpad. Uh, this one is a Wacom. I'm not being paid to say that, obviously. I've got like three subscribers, but this comes with me everywhere uh, and I'd hate to be doing any real Photoshop work without it. Do you like it? It's, uh, I got this for Christmas and under my supervision, it's just flourishing. It was all brown like a month or two ago. Look at it now. Filling me with oxygen. I'm quite proud of it. Ugh. Number eight, learn to use the pen tool. Of all the selection tools, the pen tool is the toughest to master. It's the least intuitive, but it's the most useful. If you're anything like me, you'll delay learning to use it and you'll try and use other stuff instead. Don't, just spend a couple of hours getting familiar with it, go through the hustle of making all the mistakes uh, and you won't regret it because it is so, so useful. Number nine, we're getting there. The other selection tool that I find most useful, particularly when you're dealing with color or like clear skies or anything like that, is color range. So if you go up to select, color range, and select the color you want to select, you'll see here that you get an outline of what is gonna be selected. And if you increase or play around with this fuzziness, more of the image will become selected. As with any selection, white means it's selected, black means it's not. So in this instance, uh, all the red on the balloon is selected. If I wanna change that to the white, then obviously there is a lot of white in this image, you'll select a lot of the image. If I change it back to red, then it'll only select the red. That's okay, and you can see that that's made a nice clean selection for me. Tip number 10, last tip, uh, the clone stamp tool. The clone stamp tool, I remember when I was learning Photoshop, I say when I was learning Photoshop, I'm still learning Photoshop. I don't think you ever stop learning Photoshop. The clone stamp was the one I was most excited about. I was like, that's amazing. Sadly, a map is not the best application for a clone stamp tool because by nature, all of a map is different. And you only really want to use a clone stamp tool when you've got an area that you want to copy somewhere else. Don't really want to do that with a map, but I'll show you anyway. Uh, basically, all you do, clone stamp tool selected, choose the brush size you want, press Alt to select what you want to copy and go ahead and get rid of a line. Now, I've got a few pointers for the clone stamp tool. A, always work on a new layer. B, don't have your brush too hard or too soft. Doesn't often look realistic if you use the two extremes of the brush. And C, what was C? Yes, C is little and often. What do I mean by little and often? When I first started using the tool, I took it to be more powerful than it was. I.e., I would make a selection and just paint and just paint and paint and paint, thinking that it would look realistic if I did it all in one fell swoop. It doesn't, unfortunately. The best thing you can do with a clone stamp tool is to make little brush strokes and sample often. Uh, that concludes my tips. I imagine I'll do another video like this in the not too distant future. If you've got any questions in the meantime, just let me know. I'll just be here chilling with my bonsai. <laughs>